It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. This video was inspired by a series of events, of course, on Twitter, because Twitter is like the best place ever for dialogue. And so, for this video, I'm gonna get my personal thoughts and opinions about the recent Gallup poll that was released about race relationships between black people and white people. And so without further hesitation, let us begin. Now, according to the data, race relationships have actually been down since 2013, and it continues to went down, and one of the factors that was cited was police brutality. Now, I'm not going to lie, police brutality can in fact increase racial relationships, that is true. I also think that race baiting is also a possibility on why race relationships happen on a decrease because we always see like black deaths on TV and so I don't necessarily see like why we only focus on black deaths and not all deaths for police brutality but that's my thing but I also suggested on social media that of course you know stuff like Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, and CRT were also the main reasons why we see a downfall in like the racial relationships and of course, many people on social media call me stupid, call me a dumbass for thinking like, you know, that's also a good reason why racial relationships have been on a downcrease. And so for this video, I'm going to explain myself why exactly I think this way, because the best way to express yourself is not on Twitter, but in a video format. Let's start with the obvious one, which is basically Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was founded in 2013 basically as a response to the various police brutality that's been happening across America. And before I get my further opinions about this, I first want to state obviously that I'm against police brutality and I think that justice should be served towards those based upon like how they're treated by police. And I view things personally on an individual basis. And so, I also believe in egalitarianism, which also promotes the idea of individualism. And so, I don't necessarily see police brutality as only a black issue. I see police brutality as uniquely an American issue, first and foremost, before a black issue. So, the problem with the name Black Lives Matter is that if you immediately disagree with the name, like the whole entire movement, right? You're basically are gonna be called racist against black people just because you don't necessarily agree with the movement. You can also say stuff like, you know, well, you see, you must be in favor of police brutality because you don't necessarily support Black Lives Matter. And honestly, that name was designed to purposely, purposely try to make people pity against each other because I honestly generally believe, of course, that yes, the black lives that do in fact die by police do matter. At the same time, here are some of the reasons why I think that there has been an increase of racial tensions since 2013 from Black Lives Matter. For example, let's take a look at this video, where basically one of the people for Black Lives Matter openly, openly states that Black people cannot be racist. You know, racism is about power, and racism is about the exercise of power to disadvantage people because of race. And when we think about reverse racism, it is uh, suggested that, that people of color, people without power, are disadvantaging white people, people with power, and that, that, is, that cannot happen. Racism itself, at its core, is about the use of power to oppress or to damage or a negative um, exercise of power, and people without power cannot be racist. First and foremost, this whole entire idea is not just wrong, but it's also dangerous. It's wrong because there's obviously two types of racism. Individual racism as well as, you know, structural racism, right? And so structural racism are like policies, like legislations that is used to justify racial actions against somebody based upon their race and individual racism happens on an individual basis. And so that whole entire idea that black people cannot be racist is just wrong, but also this type of rhetoric can be used to justify 
any type of hate crime against somebody and they could just say, well, you see, I'm black, so I can't be racist. And matter of fact, there has been a recent surge of like anti-Asian crime in the United States. And guess what would happen when black people start to, you know, taunt like the Asians. And yes, they in fact say the exact same line, what I'm just show you guys right now. Another example of this sort of racial vitriol against like people from Black Lives Matter it's also that the fact that they have released like at least three different manifestos. Now, within one of the three manifestos was also the fact that one of the persons for Black Lives Matter openly asked for white people to buy black people's houses because they happen to be black. When I read this for the first time, I honestly could not believe that she would say that out loud because I don't necessarily think that white people to buy people houses based upon their skin color. I think, of course, if you want to get your own house, you should buy your own house. And there's also the complicated issue about reparations. Now, my personal stance about reparations is that, of course, I think the debt was paid by the war. Because basically, like, people on both sides were fighting, and I think the sacrifices of lives was the debt that was the reparations for the black people in this country. Not to mention the fact, of course, that during the past, there was also the foundation of Liberia for the free African slaves. And so I think that the whole entire reparations was actually paid in blood and also through Liberia from the abolitionists. And that being said, I still think, of course, that if you were to force white people to pay up, number one, you don't necessarily know their background. Like, even though, like, there might be some white people that do, in fact, have slavery that, you know, has some sort of slave owner in their family line, I don't think, necessarily, that the person should feel guilty based upon their race. Because by forcing white people to pay up just because of stuff in the past, you're not only, you know, removing their agency, but also their own personal sort of, you know, ideas of stuff. Like, I don't think, necessarily, that someone should feel guilty just because of past actions. And that's why I personally think that the idea of reparations should not necessarily, you know, be forced upon anybody. Is it obvious that, of course, that the people who experience tragedy should get reparations? Sure. But black people today have not experienced slavery. I mean, sure, there are probably some slavery in, like, in African countries, sure. But at least in the United States, we have not experienced slavery. And as an African American myself, I don't necessarily need money from stuff that I have not personally experienced. So why would you give me money for something I have not experienced? And so that's why I personally think that like the rhetoric for Black Lives Matter have probably have caused some more racial divide over the years. The next thing on my list is basically CRT. Now I first heard of CRT starting last year because basically like after the death of George Floyd, there has been many institutions and many places that implemented like CRT and also anti-racism training for the equity courses. Which is kind of sad to me because basically like CRT is probably like, you know, institutionalized racism at its worst. And how is it institutionalized racism? As a point of reference, here's a definition of CRT I'm using right now. Intellectual movement and loosely organized framework of legal analysis based upon the premise that race is not natural, biological ground and feature or physical distinct subgroups of human beings, but a socially constructed, culturally invented category that is used to express and employ people of color. Critical race theories hold that the law and legal institution in the United States are inherently racist and so far as they function to create and maintain a social, economic, and political inequalities between whites and non-whites, and especially African Americans. Look guys, I know for a fact that slavery, as well as Jim Crow, have put black people at a disadvantage in life, economically. That is true. That all the stuff that happened in the past was basically terrible. But I'm not sure as to say that every single last thing that we have today is solely based upon racism. You guys know like the Christian argument that like you know it's because of God that the universe was all created. To me this come across as no different than that God argument. 
where basically everything is to blame solely and just solely because of racism. For example, if there's not enough black people or not enough minorities, therefore we need to apply some sort of equity, which by the way is equality of outcomes, because obviously that building must be racist because it does not have enough minorities. To me, using racism for every single thing does not necessarily help. And I think, of course, by applying equity, equality of outcome, that basically what people are doing so far is literally, literally judging people based entirely off their skin color for their hiring practices. And that's the unintended consequence if you were to see every single thing as just because of racism. Now there has been some people on social media that told me as a response of my initial post that CRT is not being taught in schools. Now, according to a recent teachers union, they're literally openly saying that they want to apply critical race theory in all 50 states. And not just that though, but there has been like a series of like these sort of TikTok videos where the teachers literally openly admitting to teaching critical race theory even though the whole entire critical race theory has been prohibited in those school settings. We can also see that of course that through these Zoom calls many of these people are training teachers of this whole entire method for critical race theory and the slideshows literally say critical race theory. And so while it's technically true that they're not literally, you know, teaching, you know, critical race theory in front of kids. They're applying the principles of critical race theory to train the teachers and also to pass down onto the kids. One of the key components for critical race theory is the rejection of colorblindness and also meritocracy. Now, this sort of rejection of colorblindness is just absolutely a terrible idea because the principle of colorblindness is to basically, you know, judge people based upon their actions and their character rather than their race or, you know, sexuality and so on. And I think that's a good principle to apply for everybody. But with critical race theory, it's basically spits in the face of colorblindness and said that we need to be more racially conscious because colorblindness is not just, you know, being racially conscious. Now, because of the consequence of, you know, telling teachers that they should be more racially conscious with their students, we sometimes get teachers who literally, you know, try to pass a student just because they happen to be a certain race. I'm not even joking. As an anecdote, I heard directly from somebody in my family who is becoming a teacher, and he literally told me that even if a student who's black is failing, then they should probably pass that student and give them a higher grade just because of their skin color. For example, the treatment of Asians and also white people for SAT scores. So what happened was that it's been caught and reported in the news that basically they were giving like black people more SAT score higher because they happen to be black and they actually deducted points from the Asians and from the white people because those two group of people actually perform better on the SATs in comparison to the black people. Another aspect of critical race theory is the idea of intersectionality. Now, intersectionality has actually been applied in school. Now, what is the idea of intersectionality? Well, basically intersectionality says that there are some things that might overlap and might actually you know, cause people to have more oppression in comparison to others or have a harder time in life. For example, if you happen to be a black woman and you happen to, you know, yeah, you're black and you're a woman, basically your experience might be different in comparison to a white woman. And so the, it's almost like, of course, I think, of course, that sometimes these sort of stuff do in fact intersect. And so the idea is not necessarily wrong per se. However, when I see stuff like the white privileged march or whatever for like, you know, kids in high schools across the United States, when I see stuff like that one white girl 
who basically, you know, cried in front of, like, you know, people and just talked about how she apparently had, like, white privilege because she's white and a woman, I honestly think that sometimes this sort of idea of stuff that intersects your personal experiences actually have an unintentional consequence of adding more racial fire to the mix. Because if students are literally, you know, going out on stage, complaining to the school directors and so on about how they're treated badly because apparently they have white privilege like that one girl I mentioned before, I honestly think that this whole entire thing adds more racial tensions among the students. This final aspect of critical race theory is that I want to address that's more racially charged is this sort of idea that it supports the idea of like black separatism as well as like black nationalism. Now, I don't think necessarily that somebody should be proud about their race. It doesn't matter if they're black, it doesn't matter if they're white, I think nationalism is pretty much stupid for like race. That's obvious to me. But also, separatism is the idea of like the stuff that the people who fought in the civil rights movement fought against. Separate bathrooms or like separate water fountains, they actually fought against those ideas. Now look at it now. We have black only college spaces across America. We pretty much have like, you know, PLC color spaces only, and then like the white only centers. And so I don't think necessarily that having separate buildings for separate races does any good. And matter of fact, it actually say that people are separate but equal. I don't think necessarily that people should have separate buildings just because of their own personal race. Finally, we're gonna go into the idea of anti-racism. Now, the bestseller for like, you know, during 2020, after the death of George Floyd, were books like White Fragility, as well as How to Be Anti-Racist. Now, I'm gonna use the whole framework for How to Be Anti-Racist as a reference point for anti-racism because many places are using this book as some sort of training manual for equity. And so that's why I'm using How to Be Anti-Racist for this part. I'm sure there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of books that talk about anti-racism, but I'm more concerned about the actions in the here and the now, using the book in the here and the now, in comparison to like thousands and thousands of articles, whatever, just talking about anti-racism. Now I made an entire video just reviewing this book, but essentially one of the main things that stuck out to me the most when I was reading How to Be Anti-Racist was basically this following quotation that past discrimination justifies future discrimination and that present discrimination justifies future discrimination. When I read that quotation for the first time, basically I saw it as a reference to the past in our history. Or basically what happened was that people had to be segregated based upon their race and that of course they also had to experience slavery based upon their race. And so what they're trying to say, the author is trying to say right here, is that all the bad stuff that happened to black people should also happen to white people. If it's in the name of equity. And that to me is the most insane idea. This type of idea to me, just by this premise alone, only going to further racial tensions by actually applying this sort of principle that the action of the father carries on to the, act like the actions of his son or whatever. I cannot remember that quotation. But still, this idea that you're guilty because you're white and so therefore we should treat you badly because you're white is literally the most insane, most richly charged thing I could possibly imagine. So here you go guys, that's the main reasons why I think that social justice has caused more racial harm. I'm sorry if you guys think I'm a dumbass for thinking this way, but given that my examples have citations in the comment section down below, and considering I spent a considerable amount of time reading this sort of stuff, reacting to videos, I'm sorry, I cannot help but to conclude that it actually caused more racial divides. I'm not a dumbass for having a different opinion than you. I'm sorry. I honestly generally think it actually does more harm. Until next time, guys, take care.
It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I will <laughs> trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.